It happened on Tuesday, February 28, 1855. Five hunters rushed into the forest of Montauvern. They walked in a chain, here and there, alarmed snipe fluttered in front of them. Shots rang out, and the downed bird fell to the damp forest floor. But one snipe fell into a thick bush. The hunter leaned his gun against a tree and went into the thicket. No sooner had the branches closed behind him than his companions heard a cry of horror. Instead of the expected snipe, the naked corpse of a young woman lay before the hunter. Her head was disfigured by six gaping wounds. Her white bonnet was clotted with clotted blood. A handkerchief, a collar, and a blue ribbon lay beside her. The hunters immediately alerted the police. The victim was soon identified. Her name was Marie Bidet. She was a domestic worker and had recently been in the service of Lyon at Madame Ossandon. However, two days before her corpse was found, that is, on Sunday, February 26, 1855, she suddenly and urgently terminated the contract with her mistress, because a man offered her a more profitable place of work, and she, according to her own words, had to come as soon as possible. Madame Ossandon paid her off in full, and the young woman went on her way. Since then, Marie Badet has never been heard of again. The Lyon Criminal Police, in conjunction with the Gendarmerie, began a search from the village of Tranois, near the forest of Montauvern. It turned out that several residents of the locality were driving past the forest on Sunday evening, around 7 p.m., and heard some shouting. It seemed to me as if some woman was calling for help, said an old farmer. Yes, that's right. That was the end of it then. During the next six years, up to May, 1861, several more similar crimes were committed. Again, the young maids cried in vain for help, and for at least two of them, it proved to be the last cry of their lives. As it was established six years later, and could have been found out already in March 1855, the killer, even before Marie Bidet offered another Lyon maid, Marie Court, a promising place in the estate of Montluel near Lyon, but did not receive a definite answer from the girl. March 4th, six days after the murder, he again appeared to Marie Court, but she this time responded with a firm refusal and advised him to turn to his friend Olympia Alibert. The killer sought out the girl and secured her consent. The same day Olympia left the city with him. After a long, tiring journey, the man led her to the neighborhood of Tranua at dusk. However, as soon as they were near the forest where the corpse of Badea had been found a few days before, the girl suddenly became frightened and ran away, disappearing before her companion could react. Between March and November of the same year, at least three other girls were confronted by a man who promised them a fabulous job on a farm near Montluel. They all got off scot-free, except in one case, when the culprit took 50 francs in pocket money from his victim. The murderer had been seen by five witnesses, all of whom could accurately describe his appearance, especially his conspicuously disfigured face, but the police did not take note of this. The Bede case was shelved. Mademoiselle, by the look of you, are you a servant? Marie Pichon looked incredulously at the stranger who had unceremoniously addressed her with these words on the Guillotin Bridge in Lyons and shuddered. His stern face, disfigured by a scar and a large bump on his upper lip, was not very trustworthy. But the slouching figure, the hands accustomed to work, and the modest clothes of the villager were something to her liking. She stopped and looked at him questioningly. I only dare to speak to you, said the man, rather timidly, because I don't know my way around. I need to find a servant's bureau to hire a servant for my master at Chateau Monuel. I'm the gardener of the estate. Marie Pichon was curious. She herself would like to find a place to get away from the current owners, who pay very little for too much work. Besides, you don't get paid for asking. Yes, mademoiselle, said the man. It is indeed a good place. Count yourself a salary of 250 francs a year, and even for Christmas gifts. And the work is not very hard. To follow two cows and a calf, and in the house a little cleaning. Oh, this place was definitely to Marie's taste. The stranger shook his head hesitantly. I don't know, mademoiselle. Perhaps you would be just the right person for my master. But I can't give you time to think about it. You have to start work today. Well, happiness is in her hands. Marie Pichon immediately agreed, ran home, took the payment, packed her belongings, and a few hours later, accompanied by a stranger, boarded the train to Montluel. It was already dark when they arrived. The stranger, without a word, put her basket on his shoulders and walked away from the station. 
He had chosen a strange road, however, a narrow path across fields and meadows, away from human habitation. Marie's heart was beating more and more anxiously. She was already regretting her decision and was wary. In the middle of the rapeseed field, the stranger suddenly stopped, took the basket off his shoulders, and told Marie that he would leave her for a while, and then he would come for her. He passed over the embankment by a crossing bridge and disappeared into the woods. His footsteps could no longer be heard. Suddenly, he was almost there again. The man held a rope harness in his hands, his eyes staring angrily at Marie. With a lightning-fast movement, the harness whistled through the air. With barely enough time to deflect his head, Marie grabbed her attacker's arms. A fierce struggle ensued. The girl fell, instinctively rolled to the side, jumped to her feet and ran away. The gasping man was breathing down her neck. But the distance between them grew longer and longer, and she finally reached the railroad line. There a grate blocked her way. Marie climbed over it, saw a light in the distance, and ran toward it with all her might. The light was coming from the windows of a house where a peasant named Jolie lived. When Marie, bloodied, in a tattered dress, told him her story and asked for protection, he escorted her to Montluel, to the gendarmerie. Really, it's not much use, he said doubtfully. This sort of thing has happened here before, but the police are not very zealous. But of course, we must report it. They must do something about it at last. The gendarmes took note of the incident, indifferently recorded all the details, and then notified the Commissariat of Sûreté in Lyon. The news did not arouse much excitement there. For more than six years, there have been similar reports of assaults on maids, and there was still there, until now, F. One of the crimes has not been solved. It is true that Mademoiselle Alibert, and after her Charleby, Bourgeois, Parrain and Nicola, whose attacks had taken place in 1855, described the appearance of the culprit in some detail, and their data coincided completely with the testimony of Marie Pichon. The investigation, however, has never produced a tangible result to this day. The gendarmes who were commissioned to search the surrounding communities could find no one who matched the description. Perhaps it will end the same way in the case of Pichon, thought the commissary of Lyons. And to clear his conscience, he went over the report once more. Stop! 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 The report stated that Marie Pichon's basket had been left in the rapeseed field, and that she had lost her umbrella and bag while fighting the criminal. If these items were found, it might be possible to try to determine the criminal's path, and perhaps even find his lair. It might be worth a try. Accompanied by two assistants, the commissioner went to the scene. Gendarmes and volunteers from local residents have already searched all the rapeseed field, the railroad bed, and the forest. The maid's belongings had disappeared without a trace. The perpetrator must have had time to collect them after the attack. But from this we must conclude that his hiding place was somewhere near the scene of the crime. Four things stood out to the commissioner. The first was that the victims were always only maids. The second was that everything leading up to the crime, from making contact with the intended victim to the attack, perhaps even to the murder. The commissioner shrugged, remembering the reports of missing girls also maids, was exactly the same from time to time. Thirdly, from the testimony of the victims, at least of those who had reported to the police, it was easy to conclude that the same perpetrator had always acted, for the descriptions always included a scar, a swelling on the upper lip, a slouching figure and peasant clothes. And fourthly, all the girls took the bait in Lyons and were then brought to the neighborhood of Montluel. Gendarmes with a description of the criminal's features were again sent to the surrounding villages. And this time, they were lucky. After a few days, they found that in the neighborhood of the community of Dagnot, very close to the place where the attack on Marie Pichon was committed, lives a couple Dumoyard. Martin Dumoyard, the husband, fits this description. Moreover, people from Dagnot, who had apparently been shunned by the police since 1855, reported that something was not quite right in the Dumoyar's house. The husband is often out at night, the wife is always wearing new clothes, and her blouses and skirts are too big or too small. And in general, none of the residents know exactly what the couple lives on. Wasting no time, the commissioner summoned the couple for questioning. From the first questions about their alibi for the night of May 26th, 
the husband and wife were confused by the contradictions. In the meantime, the gendarmes searched the house and the area around it and found many articles of clothing and various items, the origins of which the Dumoyards could not give a clear answer. Finally, on the evening of the same day, Martin Dumoyard was confronted by Marie Pichon. Yes, it is he, said the maid firmly. Dumoyard was taken into custody. Now the real work began for the commissioner. First of all, the previous reports had to be retrieved and scrutinized again. Then it was necessary to find out the owners of the things confiscated from Dumoyard, a whole collection of 1056 items, mainly dresses, skirts, blouses, bonnets, garters. There were 67 pairs of stockings of all sizes, 38 hats, 10 different corsets, and 71 handkerchiefs, among other items. Some of the outer garments and underwear were stained with blood. Apparently, de Moyard's firm was thriving. Mary Pichon's belongings were also found among the confiscated items. Suspicion was replaced by certainty. The Lyon murderer of maids was Martin Dumoyard. Dumoyard was photographed, and with these photographs the gendarmes literally combed the entire Rhone department, aiming to find among the maids possible unrecorded victims of the criminal. Acting in this way, they came upon Marie Laborde, an innkeeper in Montmagne, who identified Dumoyard and testified as follows. One evening early in January 1860, Dumoyard appeared at her hotel accompanied by a red-haired woman whom he claimed to be his niece. When he demanded a room for two from the hostess, the niece suddenly jumped up from her chair and rushed out of the hotel. Dumoyard rushed after her. They did not return that evening. A few days later, Dumoyard again came to the hotel for a moment and said that he had allegedly left that evening with his niece, and therefore the planned overnight stay had not taken place. The landlady, as it turned out, had a very good memory, and she described in detail the appearance of the niece and her clothes. From Dumoyard's collection, she at once selected the girl's dress and basket. The niece was never found. Dumoyard probably killed her and buried her somewhere. This was evidenced by some hints made by Madame Dumoyard to her cellmate. She said, I know they want to find the redhead, but it will take them a long time to find her. Madame Dumoyard, a reserved, grouchy, and calloused woman who had been married to Martin Dumoyard for 20 years. The police owed it to her to solve another murder. She didn't have a sweet married life. Her husband was lazy, rude, and promiscuous. She had peace from her husband only during his often multi-day robbery trips in the neighborhood. But she depended on her husband, and in her life with him, she became as cold and unfeeling as a piece of iron. She was no longer horrified by the bloody clothes that her husband removed from the women he killed, and his stories about the robberies he had committed, she even loved. At heart, this woman was even more primitive than her husband and the interrogating official easily managed to get from her the necessary testimony. In the course of the search, the gendarmes became aware of the Montluel station controller, who told them that in November or December 1858, Dumoyard got off at the station with a young girl. Dumoyard had then received the young woman's suitcase on the baggage check, but had then deposited it back in the station luggage room from where it was never taken again. The girl, whose name remains unknown, has also since disappeared without a trace. The examining magistrate questioned Madame du Moyard and asked her some skillfully put questions. Judging from them, she decided that her husband had already confessed and began to testify. The examining magistrate ordered a thorough search of the woods near Montmain and at the exact spot which Martin du Moyard had named to his wife, and which she then pointed out during the interrogation in a hole barely covered with soil, they found the skeletonized corpse of a girl with a broken skull and no clothes. Judging from the skeleton, the unknown murdered woman was about 25 years old. Martin Dumoyard, who was presented with the remains of the murdered girl, did not show the slightest excitement and vigorously contested his guilt in the murder, as in the case of Marie Badet. Yes, of course, he knew and even buried the body himself. But to kill? No, someone else did it and Dumoyard began to tell the bewildered official an incredible outlaw story. According to it, he was merely the tip-off of two bearded lechers who raped young girls and then brutally murdered them. Dumoyard was only supposed to bury the corpses, and in payment for this, he received the belongings of the murdered men. And the pleasure, he said, always went to others. 
Well, what about the girls who escaped him, Marie Pichon, for instance? Yes, of course. He let them escape out of mercy. The investigation lasted eight months, and every day new evidence against Dumoyard came to light. For example, the maid Rosalie Nicola Bar Gardner. Dumoyard entangled in 1859. In the woods, he attacked her, searched, and robbed. The same thing happened to an unusually beautiful woman, Julie Fargeau, whom he also attempted to rape. In April 1860, Louise Marie Michel escaped from him in the woods near Neville. Seventy victims were recovered, and this was certainly only a fraction of his victims. Several girls seen with Dumoyard disappeared without a trace. Others who escaped from him and told the villagers what had happened could not be found. Of the 1,056 items of clothing and other things that Dumoyars hid in their den, only 500 were identified by their owners. The Dumoyars had already sold or burned many of the items. The police caught on to a tiny tip, unwound the whole tangle and found more than one corpse. In a lady's Percy, kept in the Dumoyars house, was a certificate from the Lyon Hospital in the name of a certain Ulalia Bousseau. It transpired that Ulalia Bousseau was in the hospital to get rid of a pregnancy. Where she is currently staying is unknown to the management of the institution. However, Olalia Bousseau had a sister who lived in service somewhere in Lyon, and after a few days, the police search apparatus managed to find her. She was not yet aware of Dumoyard's arrest, but in him she recognized from a photograph of the man with whom her sister Eulalia left Lyon on February 25, 1861. Among Dumoyard's booty, her sister now identified Eulalia's trunk, several dresses, and a tulle bonnet. What have you done with my sister? she asked him angrily. Dumoyard remained silent, but succeeded in getting his wife to speak. Whether it was February 26th, I cannot say, but that it happened at the end of February is certain. The husband came home with a bloody dress. This is from the girl I just killed, he said. Then the husband left to bury her. Where he buried Eulalia Bousseau, however, she did not know or did not want to say. Again the search parties were sent out, who once more combed the whole forest in the vicinity of the Dumoyars' house. It was a most tedious search without any preliminary lead. To the triumph of the police, their labor was not in vain. The corpse, barely covered by loose earth from above, lay in a shallow pit. It was the opinion of the doctors that Eulalia Bousseau had been attempted to strangle, and had been buried unconscious, but still alive. Subsequently, when the judge gave Dumoyard this circumstance as a special fault, he exclaimed, This is truly horrible. It would seem that this was the end of his case, but the criminal continued to persist and, as before, assured that he had nothing to do with the murder itself, and that the gentlemen of the police in the court should finally apprehend his bearded customers. On January 29, 1862, before a jury in Bourges began a multi-day trial of the Dumoyard couple, Martin Dumoyard was sentenced to death, and his wife was sentenced to 20 years hard labor for harboring and aiding and abetting. In March 1862, the death sentence was carried out in Bourges, in front of a large crowd of onlookers.